as his word is about to penetrate our heart and do some amazing things in and through our lives. How many of you know that the word of God is powerful? It changes everything because the word of God is Jesus. And Jesus became manifest in the flesh. And now during his time on earth, we call him Jesus. And we still worship the name of Jesus. But the name that is written across this chest in heaven is the word of God. And so we just want to make a declaration tonight. I just want you to join in with me and just repeat after me. Just say, Father God, thank you for your word. For your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Your word changes me from the inside out. I'm ready to receive. I'm willing to obey your holy word in Jesus' name. We're going to jump right into it. I've got a very solid but condensed teaching tonight on healing. And I want you to see what God has to say about healing. Because even within the Christian faith, there's fractured beliefs on what healing looks like and if it's even possible. Do you know that 56% of all Christians do not believe that God will still heal somebody today in this hour? Over half of our faith believes, it's called cessationism, they believe that all the wonderful gifts of God stopped abruptly thousands of years ago. And that was so confusing to me because I got saved from my daughter getting healed from a rattlesnake bite while laying on an operating table about to have her leg amputated. And Jesus showed up and healed her. And so my first response was, you can't tell me that Jesus doesn't heal. You can believe that if you want, but I know I've seen it with my eyes. And that's the power of being a witness. That's the power of testifying and sharing. We're already hearing so many amazing testimonies come in this month alone already from what took place even in that video that we did of some of our church family telling and sharing their story about what God's done in their life. It stirred, it completed the circle and started all over again. And it started to stir faith within people to believe if they can have it, I can have it too. And we're already seeing and hearing about the reports of what God is doing in their life. So what I want to do today is not, not stay focused on what over half of Christians think and what the majority of the world thinks, but what does God have to say about it? What is God's will when it comes to healing, when it comes to moving in people's lives? And that's what really matters. Yes? The word of God is so simple and it just gives us such a beautiful map. And we're going to jump into it in just a minute. But I want to show show you what I want to focus on is just let's understand what God's will is in this. What is his desire? What does he have to say? And, And that's really number one is understand God's will. God our father, what is his will for his people? And in Psalm 103 verse 1, we start to see that where the psalmist begins, let all that I am praise the Lord. With all of my heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. We need to make this personal tonight. God has done Good things in our lives. You may be here and be like, I don't really know, man. Like, my life's been pretty rough. All good comes from God. So if there's a good thing, and I know that there is, you may be the worst pessimist in the world, but I promise you, there's good things that have taken place in your life. And those good things are from God. And what God wants us to be able to do is focus on it. So let's, it goes on and he talks about some of these amazing good things. Watch this now. He forgives all. My sins. Forgives them all. Not only does he forgive them, but Jesus said, I will cast them as far as the east is from the west. I will plunge them into the depths of the sea and remember them no more. He forgives all my sins. And I put an and here with a bunch of dots because we're going to come back to this one in just a moment. Because this is easy and it's, it's good for us to hear 
and it's easy for us to believe. And we don't have a problem with this one. The next one we don't have a problem with usually is he redeems me from death. He saves my soul. And he crowns me with love and tender mercies. Isn't that good? We believe that, yes? Then look at verse 5. He fills my life with good things. That's easy to believe for a God that is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the breather of life into humanity. He is a father that cares about you more than your wildest dreams could ever imagine. And then he goes on, my youth is renewed like the eagles. And all this is like, yes, yes. So why do Christians have such a problem with the latter half of verse three? Because here's what it says in its entirety. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. We celebrate, yes, he forgives me. Let's celebrate at the same tone. Yes, he heals me because he is showing us his will for his people. And not only did he show it just with this, but he showed it over and over again throughout the scriptures. But the biggest way he showed it is with Jesus on the cross. And Isaiah 53 prophesied about it 650 years before Jesus would go through the crucifixion that he would bear the weight of all of our sins, that the chastisement of our peace would be laid upon him. And with every stroke of the whip across his back, the stripes that were created on his skin, by those we will be healed. It's amazing what the Bible teaches about healing and when we start to see what God's will is, what his desire is Not heal some, but heal all. And then this is what's so amazing about it is Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus carried out only God's will. He said, I could do nothing except for that which I've already seen my father do. I saw it supernaturally is what Jesus is saying. I saw it in the spirit. Now I'm going to seize it in the natural. And in Matthew 8, verses 16 through 17, he says, that evening many demon-possessed people, people, does that still exist? Uh Uh-huh. Just take a mission trip with us to Africa. Truth is, you don't have to go all the way to Africa. It's all around us in America. It just doesn't manifest the same way. But when you go to Africa, that stuff manifests just like you read about in the Bible. I I, I just, just, I'll tell you just quickly. I, I love my daughter. She's like, Oh, she, she's, she's her, her daddy's girl. And, and we went to Africa and they have what they used to call. Now they've, they've made it more politically correct in their name. Called, I don't know what it's called exactly today, but it used to be called the demon clinic. Freedom tent sounds so much better. I like the demon clinic. Like, so when you're sitting there and there's a hundred thousand people in the crowd, as soon as Johannes from SOS starts preaching the word of God, he doesn't say anything about demons. As soon as the word of God goes forth, they just start to manifest. And they have teams that, that lovingly carry, carry these people into this healing tent. But at the time it was called Demon Clinic and Candace came to me and said, Daddy, I want to go in there. I said, girl, you ain't ready for that. You, you, ain't, you ain't ready for that. I said, you need to pray up and fast. And then daddy will take you in three days from now. And on the third day we went in there and she got to see with her eyes. 30 something people, young girls that literally practiced witchcraft and were used in human sacrifices and the sacrificial blood was poured into their mouth. And that's when they said after they were set free, that they were so completely set free, they felt like their entire life from that moment on, they were living in this darkness and all they could do is listen to this this evil voice that was speaking to them to tell them what to do and when to do it. And then they said as soon as somebody started to pray for them, this light came piercing through the darkness and they saw Jesus and he set them free. 
So this is not just something for like a long time ago. This is still happening today. But that evening, many deeply possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out evil spirits with a simple command. We could do that. And look what it says. And he healed all the sick. He healed all the sick. You know why? Because he knows his father's will. So he healed all the sick. What's interesting is the only time you see, it wasn't a matter of what Jesus couldn't do. He was capable to do it. But the only time that he chose not to is when he went to his own own hometown and they rejected him. And they had doubt in him because he was just a carpenter's boy. And they had doubt in him. And he said, because of the doubt here, I'm only going to perform so many miracles that I'm out. But that's where we start to get a picture of how much doubt hinders faith because doubt is a product of fear and fear and faith cannot coexist within the same body you cannot be a person of faith and a person of fear doesn't mean like what tiffany testified about tonight what a powerful testimony doesn't mean that fear is never going to come on you because you're a person of faith it just depends on what you're going to do with fear. Will you let fear dominate you and take control of you? Or will you rise up in the faith that God has given you and allow God to take control of that fear and defeat it for you? Because the good news is you don't have to defeat it yourself. The battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. And if we could really learn that, I'm still learning it, but I've learned it really good over the last like four years. Woo, really, really good, like intense boot camp training. On that this isn't my fight, this is God's. But when you do, it's amazing to see what God does in and through your life. He healed all the sick. He knew the will of the Father. And Jesus said, I'm only here to carry out my Father's will. That's it. It's the only reason I'm here. Now look at number three. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Let's finish for, for verse 17, this fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah who said he took our sickness and ruined our diseases. That's Isaiah 53. And then number three is, and then this is what's so awesome, is Jesus then passes the baton on to humanity. And he empowered us to do exactly the same as he did on this earth. In Matthew 10 verses 1 and verses 8, we see he called to him his 12 disciples. And he did what? He Gave them authority. It's not in your authority, but it's in the authority of Jesus, and he's given it to you if you are a disciple of his. And the word disciple means a disciplined follower. And so sometimes when a baby Christian's like, well, yeah, I just want to go do these awesome things, and they don't happen, and they get discouraged in their faith, it's just because they've not disciplined their faith yet to a level where they are able to truly get doubt out and let faith work. And it's not like it's your problem, just you're growing up. When you're first born as a baby, I promise you, you wasn't running a 100-meter dash, right? So everything, but, but then in that, this is what's so amazing is it doesn't mean just because you're a young Christian that God can't or will not use your life. It's just really upon what you are able to lay down and let God do with your life. So he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out. And then look at this again. And to heal how many diseases? Every disease and every affliction. Cancer has to bow its knee to Jesus. Mental health illness has to bow its knee to Jesus. Anxiety, depression, doesn't matter what name that the world of the devil has put on it, it has to bow to the name of Jesus. Because he is the name above all names. And he's teaching us so good here. And so it gets super practical then in verse 8. He says to them, now go. Go and heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without pain, give without pay. That's so good. You know what he's telling you? You didn't do nothing to deserve this or earn this. I gave it to you. So don't go around flaunting it like it's all about you or you're trying to get something out of it. 
do not expect a personal return when you are used by God. There will be some reciprocating effects in your life. Just your faith is built. You, you grow stronger in the Lord. You're, you're able to be a part of somebody's story. But in the end, it's just all Jesus. We're just a willing vessel and broken vessels at that. In our weakness, he is made strong. So we receive without pain. We don't have to come and, well, you know, love, love those folks that, you know, well, if you want a healing, pay this $1,000 today or buy my book or buy my holy water I got out of my kitchen sink that I called holy. It's a travesty. It's, it's, I believe it grieves God. It's a manipulation of God's word over his people to gain money. It's, it's doing the opposite of what Jesus teaches. You receive without pain, give without pain. Don't expect anything. Don't, don't, don't put your name on it. You don't own it. If you pay for something, you own it. Jesus owns it. Right? So heal the sick. It's that simple. And then we get even more practical. Watch this now. Number four. Your miracle, your miracle that you're believing for, it's actually already created. It's just waiting on you. And don't hear that like, oh, your miracle is just waiting on you. No, it's, no, your miracle, it's there. It's already in existence. It's just waiting on you to believe it. Look at 1 Peter 2, 24 says, he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Interesting, the tense of that. Not you will be, you might be, you sort of can be, If you're a really good boy or girl, Jesus is in Santa Claus, right? You don't got to leave cookies and milk by the tree. He hung on the tree freely, gave it to you freely and want you to receive it freely so that you can give it to somebody else freely. And it can just keep going like that over and over again. But the focus of this is, is that you have been. What does that mean? And Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes, you are. Like it's just, it's there. You are. And I know that sometimes, and I, and I want to handle this very, very directly, is there should never be guilt or shame on you if you've been believing for a miracle or a healing in your life and you have not yet seen it manifest. Don't, don't let the devil twist that up and get you believing, well, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I didn't pray hard enough. Maybe I didn't fast hard enough. Now, there are things if the Holy Spirit convicts you, like, you know, if you have, you know, sore thumbs because you keep hitting them with a hammer, you should probably stop hitting them with a hammer. So the heal, you, you follow what I'm saying? Like, I can't, I can't ask God, well, I can, but, you know, it's just, He's trying to help me be better than that is I I can ask him like, okay, God, I've lived super unhealthy and I'm going to continue to live super unhealthy and it's producing these results in my life. So I want you to heal me of them so I can continue to live unhealthy. Are you listening now? There's that balance to it where we have to also take responsibility and know that we have a temple that God has given us that is here to house the Holy Spirit. Body, soul, spirit, all of it belongs to God. And we have a responsibility within ourselves to make sure that we aren't continuing the bad habits or the unhealthy thoughts or living that we were to get ourselves in that position because then we're just, you know, we're we're not going to, to, it's like, You're raising a child and you say, I want you to do your homework and you'll get your allowance. They don't do their homework, you give them allowance anyway. Guess how many more times they're not gonna do their homework. And so he's a good, good father and he's fathering us and helping us understand, yeah, he is, his will is, he will do it. It is done. It's here, it's waiting on you to just walk into it and receive it. But you also have to be diligent 
in caring for the great gift that God has given you and making sure that you're not putting yourself back in that position. And then number five, look at this now. Faith for your miracle. Faith for your miracle. Faith works in these wonderful ways. We see all the way throughout the scripture, it was the woman with the issue of blood. Her faith, Jesus said, he said, your faith made you well. When the friends dug a hole in the ceiling and dropped their friend down he, that, that was paralyzed, he said, their faith made you well. And then there was times where Jesus just pressed through the crowd and he had a word of knowledge over somebody or he saw somebody that just was in need of healing and his faith made them well. And so faith works in all kinds of different avenues, but the bottom line is you got to have faith somewhere. Somebody's got to have it in the mix. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then that becomes the delicate balancing act to make sure that we don't allow fear or doubt to hinder the faith that is at work within our lives or somebody else's life on our behalf. And this is what James says in chapter 5 of verse 14. He says, is anyone among you sick? Then let them call the elders of the church forth to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And then look what he says. And the prayer offered in faith. It has to be in faith. The prayer offered in faith will, not maybe not, might not, sort of not, kind of, it will make the sick person well. I remember when I was first starting out, like in vocational ministry, and I was a youth pastor in and I was in this, you know, we just had this unbelievable movement going on. And we grew from like just a handful of kids to packing out a massive room. And, and one night during worship, the Holy Spirit, he just whispered to me, I want you to call forth everybody that needs a healing in their life. Whether it be mental, emotional, physical, because I want to heal them. And I was like, so what you talking about, Willis? Are you talking to me? You talking to me? Like, you ain't talking to me. Like, like I've done a lot of like neat things so far, but I'm just like a pup. I'm just getting started. And I've been in a church where I've seen people that have been paralyzed for 15 years stood up out of wheelchairs. I'm like, yo, that's like pastor's job. Like, that's what you've put on his life. I'll just... Leave it for him. And then I sat there, or I stood there, and it just wouldn't shake. I couldn't shake it, and I I just kept hearing him. No, call him forth. I, I just need you to be willing. I don't need you to know anything but to know me and to trust me. I just need you to be willing. I'm like, no, I ain't doing it. And the worship team, they were kind of wrapping up, and they're looking down at me, and I'm, I'm giving them the, the hand motion. Keep going doing so good, so anointed. But really on the inside, I'm like, ah, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. And then I asked the Holy Spirit, I I know that I should not ask for signs because in the Old Testament, the believers of God, they followed signs. But in the New Testament, Jesus said the signs will follow us. But I kind of need one. Just putting a chit in, you know, just, just a request, like if you could throw me one, I really could use it because I really, really want to do what you want me to do, but I really don't. And I remember the girl's name was Tasha who was leading worship, and she looked down at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> so anointed. And then the head usher, his name was Ben. He came down, they called me coach, and he's like, coach, I need you to come to the back of the room. I'm like, Ben, not now. He's like, no, 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 coach, coach, serious. I'm like, Ben, please, please. Like, I'm in the middle of something. <laughs> then I'm going back, God, please, I need the science. And then Ben's like, no, 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 I, I really hate to do this to you, man, but you need to see what's happening in the back. Of- I'm like, Ben, handle it. <laughs> I'm trying to handle my own stuff right now. And then the Holy Spirit said, I just gave you what you asked for. Go look. 
And I said, Ben, what is going on in the back of the room? He said, you remember Luke, the, the, the young man that, that just got saved a few months ago and, and he has leukemia and he walks on arm crutches because after all the chemotherapy, his, his bone marrow and his bones are so brittle and he was so depleted. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I know Luke. What about it? He said, he just threw his crutches down in the back of the room and he is running up and down and jumping and praising Jesus that he is healed in his body. I was like, that's all I needed. And I got up, and God moved. Healed a hole in a girl's heart that she's about to have surgery on. Set free so many young people from cutting themselves and self-affliction to try to ease their pain that's on the inside. And I mean, just there were 77 medically documented miracles alone that night along with so many other powerful testimonies of the inner healing that people received. And I didn't do anything but just say, if you want and believe for a healing tonight, come forth. Jesus is going to do it. And he did it. And look at this continues on now. Therefore, it says, confess your sins one to the other and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 